So in this video, I want to talk about another technique for being able to identify rootkits, and that technique is known as hook detection. So if you recall, hooking is a popular technique that a lot of rootkits use to camouflage themselves on the system. And really what, what hooking basically involves was uh, is, is the idea of kind of having the rootkit modify some aspect of the execution path so that it can interfere with the results. And, and typically this will be done by, let's say, changing an address to which some function points so that instead of pointing to a legitimate function, it'll point to malicious code that's owned by the rootkit, so to speak. Now, there are many system, uh, places in the system, rather, where a uh, hook can be placed, and these include the import address table, the uh, system service dispatch table, or the SSDT. You can do inline function patching, which I've, I've talked about as well. Actually, I've talked about all three of these in previous videos. The interrupt descriptor table, the IDT, and also uh, the IO request packet handler, or IRP handler. Now, one strategy for trying to detect a rootkit is to see if any of these locations have been hooked. You can do that, but I think it's often uh, much easier said than done. And the reason for that is that the rootkit itself may be trying to interfere with your ability to even look for these hooks in the first place. So uh, it's not a very easy technique, but at the same time, I think this approach, uh, at the very least, it's predicated on the idea of generic identification of rootkits. And as such, it won't be limited to specific rootkit signatures. It may in fact be able to identify brand new rootkits, rootkits you've never seen before, rootkits that aren't identified by a signature. So there's still a lot of value in this uh, particular technique. So let me describe uh, one particular way in which you can identify a hook. Uh, so if you recall, you know, what, what, what is a hook? A hook is basically a situation in which you might place, let's say, a branch instruction. So let's say you've got a piece of code here, and uh, you know th this code might be a few lines. And maybe somewhere in here, you'll have a branch instruction. So you'll put a, let's say, a jump. And what the rootkit will do is it'll modify that instruction. And it'll put, uh, let's say, a malicious address uh, instead. Or maybe it'll, it'll put a jump to a malicious address. And that jump will point to some piece of code that's, let's say, really bad at the rootkit code. So let's, this is the rootkit's code. as opposed to, let's say, going to some legitimate location where the, uh, where the previous uh, code was located. So like the previous the code was located at some legitimate place. And instead of going to the legitimate place, you've now gone to the, the malicious place because the rootkit has modified uh, the original location. So let's say this is the, uh, the original location. Okay, so the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to look for um, and, and specifically, we're going to look at this address because this address has to be specified by the rootkit as part of the modification, and it's the, the address that points to the malicious code. And sometimes you can tell by examining this address that it's actually somewhat suspicious. So, for example, uh, imagine we were dealing with uh, the import address table. So, imagine this is the import address table. And I talked a bit about the import address table in a previous video, but let me kind of give you a quick rundown. So, the import address table will be a table of addresses that's associated with a particular uh, process. Imagine there's a process here that that uh, uh, is associated with this, this IAT. Okay, and each entry in the import address table uh, is going to point to a specific function that's being imported by that process. And so let's say the, the process might be importing some functions. The location of those functions will be in the IAT, um, and then these functions uh, will be will be mapped by the IAT. And, and specifically, the IAT is going to point to specific functions. These functions will be in a specific module. So for example, uh, the module might be, I don't know, let's say kernel32.dll. Uh, so if we're dealing with user space here, so kernel32.dll uh, uh, might be the name of the, the actual module. And this module, it turns out, will have two properties that, that are very relevant here. The module will have both a legitimate starting address, and let's call that uh, A. OK, and that's the address at which the module starts. And usually, the module also has a well-defined size. Let's call that size s. And so as a result, any address of a function in this module has to be within the range. Uh, at the, the lower end is going to have to be, the address is going to have to be at least a. And at the upper end, the address is going to be at most a plus s. And so if you see a legitimate entry, let's say there's a legitimate entry in this IAT. Let's say this entry is legitimate here. OK, this entry will have an address that falls within this range. So the, the address range is always going to be between A and A plus S for a legitimate entry in the rootkit. Now, if you happen to see an address, let's say you see this other address 
and this other address happens to fall outside the range. Let's say it's fall, it falls in here, and this is, uh, you know, it's either going to uh, either be smaller than a, or maybe it'll be, you know, bigger than a plus s. Then you know for sure that you're dealing with a function that's somehow not not legitimate. It's clearly outside the acceptable range of addresses, and, and as, as such, it's going to most likely be a rootkit or, or something of that nature, something that, that's not quite kosher. Now, a similar approach actually will work for device drivers. And in fact, uh, the address associated with an I/O request packet handler is expected to be within uh, the address range of the driver, and, and also. Uh, moreover, the, the address associated with the system service dispatch table, the SSDT, uh, that's also going to fall within the range of what's called NTOS kernel. Um, let's write that down. NTOS kernel, NTOS kernel. Uh, .exe, which is the name of the uh, the kernel process that's associated with the uh, system service dispatch table. So, um, as a result, you'll be able to find, um, uh, in many cases, you'll be able to find situations in which the address specified in the hook is not quite legitimate, and you can look for that as a mechanism for identifying the rootkit. Now, um, aside from the cases I just mentioned, I think I mentioned that the easier cases, so to speak, um, it can be harder to detect some of these other cases of hooking. And the reason for that is that the, the address range might not be as clean, and you may not be able to easily identify something that's outside of that address range. Uh, but, but having said that, I mean, even though it's more difficult, it may not always be impossible. Um, but, but still, I mean, nonetheless, the idea of being able to identify hooks as a rootkit detection mechanism is still very valuable, and you shouldn't discount it, because it's generic in nature, and it might actually help you identify rootkits that were previously unknown on the system.